Thank you and greetings from the folk at Newtown who are meeting right now as well. The Book of Lamentations has a lot of heart-rending thoughts from the prophet, but in the middle of it, in chapter 3, you read from verse 22 these wonderful words. Through the Lord's mercies we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore I hope in him. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul who seeks him. It is good that one should hope and wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. You know, I like to um, try and get a biography in. Well, we have one tonight. Augustus Toplady. We were talking about him just before the service. Do you, some of you may know a lot about Augustus Toplady. I've got to confess, I didn't really. I just found him a, a lovely name whenever I read the hymn book. Um, uh, he wasn't born in August. That really disappointed me, actually. He was born... In Farnham, Surrey, November the 4th, 1740. His dad was an officer in the British Army. His mother was a woman of remarkable piety. And he, Augustus, prepared for the university at Westminster School. And then he went to Trinity College, Dublin. While on a visit in Ireland in his 16th year... He was awakened and converted at a service held in a barn in Coddy, Maine. I've never heard of Coddy. It's C-O-D-Y-M-A-I-N. And the text was this, Ephesians 2, 13. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. That's a powerful text, isn't it? And it spoke, uh, God spoke through that too. Augustus Top Lady. The preacher was an, Ill an illiterate but warm hearted layman named Morris, shades of Spurgeon's conversion. There, aren't they? Concerning this experience, Top Lady wrote Strange that I, who had so long sat under the means of grace in England, should be brought nigh unto God in an obscure part of Ireland amidst a handful of God's people met together in a barn and under the ministry of one who could hardly spell his name. Surely this is the Lord's doing, and it is marvellous. In 1758, when he was 18, through the influence of sermons preached by Dr. Manton on John chapter 17, he became an extreme Calvinist in his theology which brought him into conflict with Wesley and the Methodists. He was ordained to the ministry in the Church of England in 1762, and in 1768 he became vicar of Broad Hembury. Anyone know where that is? Devon. A small living in Devon, which he held until his death. The last two or three years of his life he passed in London, where he preached in a chapel on Orange Street. He spent his last two or three years extremely ill, and there's all sorts of things that I was able to find concerning how he testified to God's grace and help as he was dying, really. I mean, he died at the age of 38, which is nothing really, is it? But he, he was severely unwell, but he had great, contacts and testimony to give a short time before his death he asked his physician what he thought the reply was that his pulse showed that his heart was beating weaker every day top lady replied with a smile why that's a good sign that my death is fast approaching and blessed be god i can add that my heart beats stronger and stronger every day for glory. To another friend he said, 
Oh, my dear sir, I cannot tell you the comforts I feel in my soul. They are past expression. My prayers are all converted into praise. He died of consumption in 1778 on August the 11th. But during his, his relatively short life, he did a lot. He wrote, uh, put together rather, a volume of psalms and hymns for public and private worship, published just two years before he died. Contained 419 hymns, many of which were written by him. Now, there's a great long list when you go to hymnary on the web. I picked out one or two. Some you won't know, I, I guess. Some are, you'll be very familiar with. And some of them very much have a nautical theme. Listen to this. At anchor laid, remote from home. These are first lines. Awake, sweet gratitude, and sing. Encompassed with clouds of distress. If on a quiet sea toward heaven we calmly sail. Do you see what I mean about the nautical references? Inspirer and hearer of prayer. You'll know that one. When languor and disease invade. Grace, tis a charming sound. Written with Philip Doddridge. Hail, thou one despised Jesus. Now, when you look in Mission Praise, let me check, it's down for John... Bakewell. We're going to sing it in a minute. 203. Hail the once despised Jesus. A lovely hymn. But he's down in some hymn books. And it's because he added verses as alterer. Which I think is a lovely thing. A-L-T-E-R-E-R. He was mightily used of God in a very short space of time. He had no sort of big... Uh, well, he had a big testimony to give. But there were no sort of exciting things that happened in, in one respect. But he was a great saint of God. I hope that's given you a little bit of a picture. Um, there's loads more. As I say, during those last three years, he was mightily used even in his weakness. And isn't that often the case with hymn writers? You find that. So, that's top lady. <laughs> right, let's come to the word of God. Um, we're going to be looking at James chapter 1. James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greetings. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith, with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways." Let the lowly brother glory in his exaltation, but the rich in his humiliation, because as a flower of the field he will pass away. For no sooner has the sun risen with a burning heat than it withers the grass, its flower falls and its beautiful appearance perishes. So the rich man also will fade away in his pursuits. Blessed is the man who endures temptation. For when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when desire has conceived... It gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, 
and comes down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth, that we might be a kind of firstfruits of his creatures. Well, the world in which we live is a beautiful place, isn't it? We've got the signs of spring already happening, and it's just a bit sad that the blossom's getting a little bit wet at the moment. The beauties of creation are wonderful. So many good things we have to enjoy. Our homes, our families, the stability of the country in which we live, the care shown by others. But we are very blessed. There's many parts of the world where it's inviting death to meet in this way tonight. To be a Christian is a very dangerous pursuit. But there are snares in our society. It's getting harder, isn't it, to stand for the Lord Jesus. And we can get tripped up. Our witness, indeed, can get tripped up. And we can be left sprawling in the mud of sin. We can compromise our witness to our Saviour. And we've always got to be on our guard, haven't we? The devil is going around like a roaring lion, seeking who he can de devour. We need to keep looking to Christ, don't we? Looking to him, being on our guard. James, in the uh, earlier verses of chapter 1, has already urged his readers to persevere, to look to God in all circumstances, predominantly Jewish readers. They're under pressure. They're being persecuted for following Christ. He's pointing them to the fact that their hope and our hope is in God's salvation, his grace and mercy. He's looking, in, as the heading has it, how they might profit from trials. You see that from verse 2 of chapter 1 onwards. Outward trials coming in. But also, we need to look at what might happen within ourselves. We need to look at our, our hearts, the desires of our hearts. And that's what we're going to do. We're going to look at some trials that might come to us and what James is saying in verses 13 to 18. You see, when there are problems nowadays, when somebody's got something that they don't like and, and it's really upsetting them, it's never their fault. Have you noticed? We live in a kind of blame culture. They need to do something about it. But often the problem is with me, not them. And the Christian needs to divorce themselves from this sort of culture in which we live. When it's their fault, they need to sort it out, I need this, the government's got it right, all of that. We need to look at ourselves first, don't we? Remember that old adage, when you point the finger at someone, how many are pointing back at you? Yeah, three. The Bible tells us that we're all sinners. Unpopular message nowadays, we're all sinners. And that once saved, we're not going to be freed from the sinful world or from its effects. So we need to be on our guard. Recognise sin for what it is and resist it in the strength that God gives us. And to do so, we have to know ourselves, how prone we are to sin. And secondly, we need to look to God to deal with it. Two big headings tonight, two major headings if you like. Know yourself and look to God. The subheadings under each. Four in each, in fact. So know yourself. Well, people, I think, still do go on these self-awareness courses to find out about themselves, what their strengths, what their weaknesses. We've got a self-awareness book. We've got the scriptures that tell us all about ourselves. And here, in verses 13 to 15, we've got something that will help us to understand ourselves better some instructions really a manual from James 
as to what to do. And from verse 13, for instance, first sub point, don't make excuses. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. We are all going to be subject to trials and temptations. The Lord Jesus himself was tested, wasn't he? They're a fact of, of life. It's how you respond to them that's important. They raise the questions that, as one commentator puts it, as to whether we have religion enough to keep us. And I don't mean formal religion. If we are so much in tune with the Lord Jesus to keep us from falling when we're tempted. So when we are tempted, what, what do we do? Where there is something that gets into our mind, something that is unworthy, we shouldn't be, do we give house room to that little temptation? Do we think about it for a while, succumb to it? Well, the scripture is very clear. We shouldn't. But if we do, do we make excuses? Well, when we fall short of what God wants, there are no excuses that can be made. Even if the sin seems reasonable in someone else's eyes or even our own eyes, if it's wrong in God's eyes, it's wrong. Our sinful actions cannot be explained away. Don't make excuses. It was only a little white lie. No. There is no such thing as a little white lie, is there? It got me out of a sticky situation. Mm. No, not really. I didn't hurt anyone. Heard that one. No, we should be people whose word is our bond who are known for our truthfulness, because ultimately, God is truth, isn't he? God doesn't deal in shades of grey. It's either black or white. It's either right or wrong. He's not economical with the truth. He is the truth. We can lie our way out of trouble before men, but not before Almighty God. Adam and Eve found that out the hard way, didn't they? In the Garden of Eden, they tried to cover up. And look what happened there. Well, here you see, you've got this statement, which I don't know if any of us have ever used it, but it obviously was an issue. Let no one say when he's tempted, I am tempted by God. God does not tempt people to sin. Someone might say, he's put me in this situation. No, no, no. God does all things for our good. Second sub-point, he cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone, because he is utterly pure. If God did, in fact, tempt people to sin, then he would not be holy, would he? He would be committing sin himself. He's holy. Set apart. He's not as men are. The Lord Jesus was without sin. James is in no doubt that God does not and cannot cause such temptations. Yeah, we might be tested like a metal is tested to get the impurities off. But to sin, causing us to sin, he doesn't do that. His purposes are perfect and right. The word that's used in, in verse 13 is, in Greek, apparently, aperiostos. Any Greek scholars here, if I got it wrong? All right. And it means unversed or unexperienced in evil. And that's God. That's our great God. He is pure. He is thrice holy. Holy, holy, holy Lord. He has no experience of trafficking in evil. And if you look in Habakkuk chapter 1 verse 13, his eyes are purer eyes than to behold evil. 
He's altogether lovely. His person can never be defiled. His purposes can never be deflected. His power can never be diminished. His promises can never be devalued. Our God is perfect. He is a great sovereign God. Like Isaiah, we should be falling down before him because we are not like that. And he is utterly trustworthy. We sang at the start, great is thy faithfulness. And it is. He is faithful even when we're not. What a great God we have. Isn't it wonderful? Whilst he's here, James is pointing out how wrong we are in the midst of this. He's pointing us to how great God is. In this world of uncertainty, he is the only constant, the only reliable one to whom we can go. And to blame him for our troubles, that's silly. That is just so counterintuitive and wrong. Verging on blasphemy. Because it's our fault. Look at verse 14. Each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. It's our own evil desire. When we're falling short of what God would have us do, when we're falling into sin, it's because of ourselves and that sin that's within us. And the verb used here is quite strong. The picture is of a forceful dragging away. If you think of an animal, uh, say a lion that's got a gazelle or something like that, and it pulls that animal away towards its lair to, to feast on it later, it's that pulling of that animal that's been caught. The word entice equally strong. And that's a picture of fishing. If you think, I don't know if any of you are fisher men think Andrew no you're not a fish no um, but what you have to do is put a worm don't you on the end of a, a rod and you put it down there in order to catch the fish because the fish sees something they fancy or it might be a, a small a little fish that a big fish would go for they're enticed and they go it looks attractive they get hold of it and suddenly they're out because they have been caught the verb used in this verse, 14, is the one used in 2 Peter 2.14 in the context of false teachers. They get you along with all these false words and they've hooked you. We're not to be like that. If the superficial attractiveness of these things is not resisted and a person is drawn in, it's like that fish that's floundering and can't get off desire in itself is not sin it's only when a person by an act of the will assents to its enticement that sin results so we need to watch out we have to be careful we have to make sure that we are living in such a way that God will be pleased with us And not give in to those things that used to entice us. Those things that used to drag us away. Because they are trouble. If you look at 14, it talks about each one. We have individual responsibility. People sin because they want to. The powers of darkness and the circumstantial opportunities... Just make it a more attractive proposition. We need to look to ourselves, keep ourselves pure, keep looking to Jesus. Because otherwise, we may fall. Because if we don't, what's going to happen? Verse 15 tells us. Downward spiral. Slippery slope. Set of consequences. And here, the picture is one of of birth. Conception, then birth. If we don't resist, if we don't get rid of those desires and we don't just just push them away, then we have real problems because desire that is realised gives birth 
to sin and sin is full grown. Birth, baby is born, grows to an adult. A little falling into sin becomes a much larger sin, a lot more problems later on. And ultimately it leads to death, as it says here. This is all strong stuff, but James has written it for the people of his day. And the Lord has given us these scriptures for us, and we need to be ready for such problems to come our way and to know how to deal with them. This heading, remember, is know yourself. If we know what we're prone to, then we can look to ourselves and help others similarly. Let's review ourselves. Let's look in the mirror. Let's look in the mirror of God's word. We need to nip every temptation in the bud. J.C. Ryle wrote a book called Thoughts for Young Men. Well, we're not all that young, all of us here, but let's take them because it's good this habits like trees are strengthened by age a boy may bend an oak when it is a sapling a hundred men cannot root it up when it's a full grown tree and that is a advice for a young man but i think it's throughout the whole of our lives we need to nip those things that would not be helpful in the bud in times of trial and temptation, it's, it's also easy to forget what we're really like and that we are sinners saved by grace. So what are we going to do in such times? We're to look to God. And that's our second substantive point. Look to God. Verse 16, 17 and 18. You see, God is the giver of every good and perfect gift. We see this in verse 17. He doesn't cause his people to sin. He gives us so much to enjoy and encourage. Every good gift, every perfect gift comes from God. He is the perfect giver. When he gives, he gives lovingly, he gives wonderful gifts. Both his gifts and his giving express his character. He's our heavenly father. He knows what we need. Not what we want, what we need. And he gives us everything. For our enjoyment, yes. For our benefit, yes. Even the difficult situations there for our good. When he's refining us. Spiritual gifts he gives to us. His Holy Spirit is given to us. The Spirit will lead us into all truth. Jesus made that plain to his disciples in the upper room. And he helps us to bring forth fruit pleasing to him. Every good and perfect gift comes from him because he is perfect. We look for perfection, don't we, in this life. But even the most flawless diamond, if you put it under an ultra-powerful microscope, has a little flaw. Our great God has no such flaws. He is perfect. He gives his people such wonderful gifts. He is the father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. That's another line from great is thy faithfulness, of course, is it? There is no shadow of turning with thee. In him there is no darkness at all. The lights here are suggested to be the stars, and he is the creator of all the lights in the universe, the stars, the moon, the sun. He is the eternal, uncreated light. Remember, light and darkness correspond to good and evil. Men love darkness instead of light because their deeds are evil. 
But God sent his son into the world, the true light that gives light to every person. He is the father of lights. We need not go anywhere else. He has it all. He is perfect. He is the one that brings light into our darkness. He does not change. There is no variation or shadow of turning. The word for this, long word, is immutability. The whole universe, his creation, is constantly moving. I don't know about you, I always find it amazing to think that, yes, it's dark here, it's night. In Australia and New Zealand, it's morning. And it's light and it's Monday. It's, it's incredible to, just to get your head around that. Our God does not change. When the sun is out, you will see shadows and as the sun moves, the shadows move. Our God is not like shifting shadows. He is unchanging. He is constant. He's not always shifting his position. He's not fickle. He is so super reliable. He's not antagonistic one day, loving the next day. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. As it spoke of the Lord Jesus, so it speaks of our Heavenly Father. Why? It spoke of Jesus, well, because he's God, of course. This is so reassuring for us, isn't it, in a changing world? When so much that perhaps we grew up with has changed and not for the good. But he is unchanging. He knows what he's doing. His purposes are being worked out. We can rest in that and we can give him the glory. Uh, equally amazingly to all of these things, he showed mercy to his creation, his creatures, us, people, sinners. And he continues to do so. Look at verse 18. This section, James, ends with the fact that in all of this, you can be reassured because he, Jewish reader, he, Gentile reader, has changed you. He has spoken to you. He has brought you forth by the word of truth. <coughs> he gave us birth. He brought us forth. And it's the new birth. It's that birth that Jesus spoke of to Nicodemus. This would have been extremely encouraging for James' first readers. That reminder of where they had been and now where they were. What a position he had put them in. He gave us birth through that word of truth. When you're reminded of your conversion, it, I'm sure it thrills your heart. When you're reminded of your baptism... I'm sure that does too. And you think back to what God has done in your life. It's amazing, isn't it? When you hear of someone else's testimony, that warms our hearts too. Well, James says, remember these things. Remember these things. Remember what God has done. He's the one who did it. It's all of him. He gave us birth through that word of truth. Why? So that we might be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. What does that mean? Just explore that as we end. James is referring back to the Old Testament. Remember, he's predominantly writing to Jewish background believers. And the Israelites were required to bring to the priest a sheaf of the first grain that was harvested. You should read that in Leviticus 23. So the likelihood is, therefore, that here, James is pointing to the fact that he and his fellow first century Christians were tokens of an amazing harvest of Christians to come through the ages, through the New Testament era. But the picture says so much more than just that. We have a great dignity 
it tells us, because the first fruits in the harvest were very special. The parts of the crop set apart for God in a particularly, particular way. And Christians too have been set apart by God, set apart from the rest of humanity. To be a child of God is an amazing privilege. We should never apologise for that. It's a wonderful, wonderful privilege. We may be pilgrims here on earth, but we're not trapped. We're children of the heavenly king. Rejoice in that. What a wonderful thing. So we have a great duty. We have a privilege to be a child of the king. We have a responsibility. We have the responsibility to tell others about our great God, about our great saviour, about how he's blessed us, how he saved us from the pit. We should have gratitude of heart, we should worship him, and we should tell of him. Our lives should be lived so that people will want to know more, will want to find out about this great one who's made such a change. Our life should be marked by a holiness that distinguishes us from other people. Yet yeah, we should be producing fruit. Not bad fruit. Good fruit. Fruits of the Spirit. Fruit that is pleasing to Him. And that gets people to ask questions. Why do you react in such a way when all these things are happening? James was encouraging his readers, and may he encourage us today. We're not to blame others. We're not to do anything that is dishonouring to God. We should give him all the glory. We should be so thankful that we are sinners saved by grace. The only person we should be pointing to is not that way or that way but that way the Lord Jesus Christ has done so much for us and is coming again to take us to be with him to him be the glory the honour and the power Amen <laughs>